Ayda hissiyeti. Good morning, everyone. I'm your host, Shashi, with you all on Global Women Dialogues talk show to create more voice for women and by women. And today's our guest is someone very special who's connecting with us from Netherlands. And she's special in terms of creating very special way leadership in women. Sophie, she's from Netherlands. She's expert on women leaders in times of conflict, crisis, and change. As I said, some, some, something very special in women leaders. So that's what she works. She creates leadership in women in times of conflict, crisis, and change. Along with that, she is a founder of Sophie's Women of War. What is all about? We will hear from her when we are going in detail. Along with that, she is New York Post and Amazon bestseller, Seducing, the, seducing and Killing Nazis, her bestseller book on Amazon. It is available. You can avail as well. So let's welcome our today's speaker, Sophie, on our Global Women Talk Show. Hear from her what's all about, what her work is all about. So welcome, Sophie, on Global Women Dialogue Talk Show. Thank you for having me. <laughs> so Sophie, first of all, it's a great pleasure to have you today on our talk show. And as I was going through about your work and I was seeing your book and all, it's really exciting that you are working something which always we, uh, we, we feel as a female we have in, our, uh, in us as a feminine leadership qualities and you are bringing these in very crucial areas in conflict in war how these women can work in these fields but before talking about your work and your expertise let's talk about your childhood let's talk about your upbringing how those upbringing how those all your childhood memories or your moments have helped you or shaped you the way you are today so please share with us a uh, very good question. Um, well, ever ever since I was a little girl, um, I was fascinated by wars and and the, uh, the impact that wars had um, on people and also uh, on next generations. I heard stories from my grandparents about World War II, um, and I was always fascinated by the news, wars raging in other countries. Uh, focusing on human rights and that really also uh, decided or made me decide to go to law school uh, and really focus on uh, war crimes um, and human rights. And al already in high school uh, when I was really absorbed by um, principles as peace and justice and equal treatment because that's also really something that uh, I got from my parents. Um, then I really got involved into a, a history project in, in my high school, um, and that was on a, on a self-chosen uh, topic. Um, and for me, that the topic was obvious. That was Hannes Hoft. Hannes Hoft, uh, for you as a, an audience, I'll explain, is uh, the icon of female Dutch resistance in World War II. She was a, a teenager uh, who literally took up arms against the Nazi occupier during World War II. And she grew up in the same city of Harlem where I grew up. So I had just read a book about her. Um, she's very famous in the Netherlands. She's an, an icon like Anne Frank. So I, I, I came across her story um, and at the same time, so I was fascinated with wars and at the same time, I, as a teenager, I was looking for role models. Uh, of, of really strong women and I really miss these stories because there is always this focus on very male uh, uh, dominated world and this especially in history this is narrative with all these male <laughs> heroes uh, but never the, the, the women's uh, stories so Hanni Schoft's story really stuck with me because of the principles of justice peace and equality, but also because she was a, a woman and a leader. She really showed uh, genuine leadership. 
So her story um, and, and that of the, the, the sisters, Trusen and Freddy Overstate, and I will <laughs> talk about them later. They, they were together as, as three teenagers um, in, in the armed resistance. Their story really runs like a red thread uh, through mm -hmm. my life, uh, both professionally and uh, personally. So that really already, as a, as a child, the interest in, in, in wars, uh, human rights and equality, uh, looking for positive, strong women role models and leadership. So that basically brings everything together. Yeah, I think that share is very important and the way you, uh, you know, combine and you bring in your own career by bringing those stories and working on those stories at very early age. Uh, it's from high school onwards, it really uh, makes sense how you create your expertise in this field. So Sophie, as you shared, um, you was always fascinated, you always worked, uh, and you was, uh, you was always looking for women leaders, uh, in, uh, uh, especially these uh, war zones or women in uh, war conflict area, and how these strong women as a, and, a, and a leader, they are creating impact. Um, what kind of a strong uh, message or a strong thing you feel um, you gained or is in general it is missing? Well, it's, it really struck me that, especially when it comes to uh, armed conflict, women are often portrayed as victims. Um, mm. And of or, yeah, of course, women and children are often the victim, mm. uh, especially if gender-based violence, as you know, uh, <laughs> yourself from, from your own uh, professional background um, and that's absolutely horrible and we definitely need to do something about that but at the mm -hmm. same time I was missing the other part the leadership uh, story part mm -hmm. because uh, they were just assumed to be victims mm -hmm. all the uh, stories of leadership of mm -hmm. really uh, connecting and rebuilding society because I saw that not only with uh, the heroines of my book of uh, uh, World War II, but later on I also did research in, in Bosnia, in Kosovo, uh, in Rwanda, mm -hmm. and then I, I just saw the same pattern all over again, that it was precisely mm -hmm. women who would resist and rebuild society. So they had the long-term perspective yeah. um, and, and the reconciliation, and those were the tools to, to really keep going and to really face the future together again, and I thought, hey, this is all they're missing. So that's why I really created my own business, uh, Sophie's Women of War, to shed light on these facets. Mm -hmm. And here, when you are talking about uh, bringing these women leadership stories and your own business, Sophie Women of War, uh, would you like to share more detail about it? Uh, it would be great for our audience to hear and to know about that. Yeah, so I think it always starts with uh, with awareness raising and, and education. Um, so that's why I, I wrote my book, <laughs> Seducing and Killing Nazis, um, on the, the three girls, Holly Schaft and the sisters, uh, Trish and Freddy Overstegen. Um, I had the honor of really knowing both Trish and, and Freddy Overstegen for, for 20 years because when I was involved in the, in the high school research project, I discovered that Trish was still alive at the time. So I called her up for an interview. She invited me over and um, yeah, a special bond uh, grew between us. She was this very nice lady, could easily have been my grandmother. And uh, she introduced me to her sister, Freddie, who was also still alive. Um, Hanni Schaft was not alive because she was unfortunately executed by the Germans just mm -hmm. before the end of the war, not even three weeks before the end. So very tragic story. Mm -hmm. uh, but the sisters survived, but at the same time, they were uh, haunted by their, their, the experiences of their past. They were traumatized uh, mm -hmm. by all the, the, the horrible uh, war stories. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I saw the, like I said, I saw the, the same pattern later on in, in the Balkans and in, in Rwanda, um, that it's, it's, it's precisely women. I mean, if you look at, uh, Rwanda, they have a, a lot of, uh, women in, in their parliament right now. If you look at Kosovo, they have their first, uh, female, uh, president. 
So in these war-torn countries, there is a role of women. Um, so at the same time, there it is really a chance for, for the world, for the countries to, to really think, okay, how can we restructure society where there is more equal opportunities for everyone? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that, that's... It's, that's really important. And when we are talking about your work and your foundation, how it is helping or how it is bringing those uh, women of war or what way um, people can get benefit if they are looking for some kind of uh, work or some development. Yeah, um, well, uh, like I said, the, the, the awareness raising, the education, so really bringing the stories out there. So with my book, but also a lot of speeches uh, that I do, um, I lecture at several universities, um, but also give trainings about leadership at uh, mm -hmm. big multinational companies. Um, and often they think, oh, okay, this is a completely different world. But if you if you use these stories that are concrete heroin uh, heroic stories that will really stuck with people, mm -hmm. then you can translate that into your own world, um, whether it's a corporate uh, world or your your professional life. You really mm -hmm. can derive leaderships uh, leadership lessons from that because these women had in common that they were very purpose driven leaders. So they had mm -hmm. people in mind. Um, and had very high um, uh, hardcore values, basically, that they embraced. So values and purpose were the um, essential ingredients for them to lead. Yeah. And Sophie, when we talk about your uh, training, uh, leadership training, coaching, mentoring, uh, I was reading somewhere you use this 5P, uh, something like that. What is all about? <laughs> yes, correct. Um, the, the 5P framework, as I call it, um, is basically what my, uh, my own business is structured about. It is that we, with every uh, leadership, um, if you examine it up closely, you can discover certain patterns um, and then you can derive the so-called leadership lessons from it. And the 5P framework is very effective. And the 5P stands for um, passion, purpose, people, perspective, and perseverance. Mm -hmm. So if you translate it also back to the, the women of, of my book, um, for example, they were extremely passionate about what they did because of course they were just teenagers. They were not uh, Jewish or they were not effective di affected directly by the war. Um, so they could have chosen to just continue their lives as, as normal as possible. But they did. They were very passionate, passionate about their ideals of, of justice and the and livable world, uh, and that also provided them with the energy and the courage to stand up for the Jewish community and, and other people that were um, uh, at risk. Um, and that that passion is linked with purpose because they had a purpose of, of saving lives. Um, of really uh, uh, these extremely, these, these core values, uh, they had a very strong moral compass of justice, peace, uh, and equal treatment. Um, and that was really what guided them through these horrible uh, circumstances. And, and the same uh, with the Balkans and, and Rwanda. You're in survival mode, so you're, it's very easy to not think of other people. But if, if you are passionate enough and if you keep your, your core values and your purpose in mind, um, then that will guide you even in uh, these horrible circumstances. Um, people, yeah, it, it, it's really centered about uh, around people and, and especially if you, if you translate it to the corporate world nowadays, um, it's, it's often, or even academic institutions, as you have probably encountered, um, is that there's often these, this drive for result, the very result oriented, you need to produce so many articles and books and so many outcome. And it, it's really, uh, they forget to really focus on people and, and invest in, um, uh, are the people healthy? Are they happy? Uh, so do you have a, a safe uh, work environment? Um, and, and often that is the focus of women, is people, whereas this uh, male, 
classical male uh, dominant world is still focused on uh, result and money. Whereas it's, it's interesting to see that we still have this myth that we believe that uh, if you just work um, enough hours, just work, 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 then, then that will mean that you're most productive um, mm -hmm. and will make the most money. Whereas there's now all the, the research shows with um, uh, the Harvard Business Review, all, all the, the, the big uh, academic institutions show that if you focus on people, um, and the result will be more productive, the people will stay healthier, they will be more committed, and they will be more passionate about their, their work, their quality of their work will improve. Um, so it, it, it's not effective if you focus on money and, and result, but really on people, and then you will see that the results are better and you'll even uh, make more money. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, yeah, if you put that in a broader perspective, um, often male-oriented uh, uh, leader or, or male leaders are, are really oriented on um, the, the, the shorter term, um, mm -hmm. whereas women really focus on the long term. Uh, so if you have a perspective that is more sustainable for, for different uh, generations, if you really focus um, on um, in inclusivity, so not only with gender, but also with cultural background, uh, religious background, uh, you name it, but age, then you'll have a more variety in your team, you'll have more innovation. Um, so it, it, it's also a different approach to really focus on inclusivity. And then last P is uh, perseverance. So that's really if you just keep on um, going um, experiment, don't be afraid to experiment. And that means just really making small baby steps and always test, is this working? So don't draft an entire plan um, and then test it at the end, <laughs> but really test it in between. And that way you'll be able to, to come up with uh, elegant solutions and, and don't be afraid to, because um, if you make mistakes, uh, yeah, it's, it's not necessarily a mistake, it's a journey. So you just redirect your journey uh, and see where that will lead you. Um, and if you really fall down, get up again. So really keep going. So <laughs> to, to, to wrap up, if you have these five Ps, uh, passion, purpose, uh, people, perspective, and perseverance, uh, you will thrive as a leader, as a person, your organization will as well, uh, whether it's a, a corporate world, uh, your family at home, um, or in, in politics, uh, a country or, or a society uh, after uh, yeah. a, a major event of war. Yeah. Absolutely. And when Sophie, when we are talking about all these five P's, which are you are bringing in a very nice way how we can align and how we can bring in our work, in our life to uh, create such kind of leadership or such kind of environment which can be more thriving and which can be more prosperous in terms of uh, all the way when we see our personal and professional life. How you see in current scenario, uh, women in leadership, uh, because we are seeing now um, more and more women are coming in leadership in very, very key positions. And uh, now in general, uh, people started understanding, or I can say the um, all genders started accepting and understanding uh, women in leadership. What is your understanding and how you see it? For the, for the future, you mean? Yes. <laughs> Uh, well, we, are, we just started, I think. Um, we, there's still a lot of uh, facilitation we need. Uh, mm -hmm. We had the first step of recognition. Uh, okay, we have female leaders and they do have uh, great qualities. Um, and uh, I'm not saying that men are not uh, good leaders, mm -hmm. but we need both. Uh, so you yes. need the variety there. You need both men, uh, male and, and female leaders. Um, and uh, yeah, really look at the different qualities, the different leadership skills that they have. Um, and again, it really comes down again to uh, raising awareness and educate people. Um, we need to create an environment where men are not threatened by women, but really see it as because men themselves in a work environment 
they will thrive as well if you have more variety, if you have uh, more female uh, leadership. So if, if that will be more your focus, that it's not a threat, but for the entire uh, society, it will be an improvement, uh, that, that is the next step. And then change always takes a lot of time. Uh, so we, we just need to, to keep uh, going. Uh, we need more women like you uh, and, and other two to really um, embrace this concept and, and, and spread the word. Um, but also we need to include men uh, in this journey because yeah, they uh, will, like I said, they will also uh, get better leaders and get better, a uh, better work environment, happier mm -hmm. people around them. Um, and, and look at very concrete examples. Uh, now with the, the COVID-19 uh, crisis, you can see that a lot of the countries where you had uh, female heads of state, were much more effective and, and decisive in, uh, in in their way of, um, well, I wouldn't really say beating the virus, but really tackling it. Um, how can you really make sure that you protect lives, that you protect vulnerable people, um, but at the same time, you'll have uh, an eye and ear for, for the rest of, the, of society. And women uh, showed a much more effective job. So yeah, let's continue with that um, so that it will be just normal <laughs> for next generations. Yeah, yeah, and that's very good, uh, I think, way to see our future when we are talking about how we see this leadership and all. And when we're talking about all these uh, leadership, women in leadership and the in, uh, changing scenario of leadership, how you define as the leadership qualities uh, as per your work, you have worked uh, in uh, conflicts uh, and war, uh, you know, those kind of areas as well. How you define leadership uh, is called? Yeah, um, what in, in, the, in especially these war-torn countries, you, you see that, um, again, you need to have the, the long-term uh, vision where you mm -hmm. focus on people um, and, and really invest in relationships. Um, mm -hmm. Because often you have these ethnic groups uh, who really were major enemies um, uh, or, or religious groups, and they need to, uh, they don't have a choice. I mean, they need, after, once a war is over, uh, mm -hmm. they still live in the same country, so they need to. Um, find a way to really be able to live next door to each other, literally, and they don't have to be uh, become best friends, but they need to find a way to, to, to make it work. Um, and then reconciliation and, and really investing in people, uh, listen to their stories, to their experiences, um, listen to... Uh, the, the stories of both perpetrators and victims bring that together in a reconciliation. There were some some great initiatives uh, with that also in, in Rwanda. Um, so yeah, that is the only way uh, of, of and, and that is really the, again the, the values based approach that women often uh, pursue more uh, than men. Um, and it takes time. It, it takes time. I mean, here even in the Netherlands, World War II uh, was so long ago, but still, you know, you can see effects on uh, on, on the, the current generations. So it takes time for healing, um, but you need to create this environment where healing is possible and not just mm -hmm. uh, say we're in control, which is a... a um, yeah, an attitude that some male leaders use, we're in control and uh, we're, we're all okay. Um, and then they deny uh, the underlying uh, emotions, um, mm -hmm. which is not going to help because they will burst yeah. out. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah. And when we are talking about, uh, you know, bringing these uh, underlying emotions and work and all, you worked yourself uh, very closely with your studies and your research in Bosnia and Rwanda and many other places, as you mentioned. Uh, would you like to share some maybe work or some stories where you found like how it is important to, uh, you know, bringing these stories in, in general and to create awareness, to create the sense why it is uh, important to work in these way? 
Yeah, uh, well, thank you. Uh, that's, a, that's a very good question. Um, to, to go back to Rwanda, for example, uh, in, in, during the Rwandan genocide, um, gender-based violence was uh, one, of, one of the top uh, war crimes. Um, and, um, and, and, and that, that doesn't just amount to rape, but it, it's really uh, accompanied with horrible mutilations, um, even with uh, HIV uh, infections deliberately in order to destroy uh, an entire population. So there's this whole um, planning behind it. Um, and then, uh, yeah, to, to come back to, to my lawyer roots, um, I find it uh, like really shocking that at first um, uh, in, in international criminal law, rape and gender-based violence was not seen as uh, a war crime at all. It was just really seen um, as, uh, as something private. Mm -hmm. like, like, whereas in, um, uh, in, in national uh, or, or yeah, in, in nation states, um, rape within uh, a, a marriage was not recognized as rape if there's no consent. The, the mm -hmm. same really was on, on this particular scale on that. And that, that took a while, mm -hmm. but it really took a lot of women's rights group to really bring that to attention uh, of the public at large and really have this, this major outcry. And now uh, finally uh, in one of the, uh, the cases of, uh, of the Rwanda genocide, it was decided that yes, rape can constitute a war crime, definitely. So you cannot get away with that. So I think that that is already a message that there is a shift toward recognition um, uh, of, of, of these women's uh, story. And this is about uh, uh, both victimization of, of women. I mean, they were victims uh, of this gender-based violence, although there were also men. Um, and then there's even a, a greater taboo. Um, but then it's, it's often women leaders and women's rights group who would, who would lobby and, and to make sure that finally the international uh, criminal laws would include rape as a war crime. So there, there's a whole movement behind that. Mm -hmm. which shows uh, women's yeah. leadership. Uh, and I think that's the way you say, uh, share that how the perspective was that not to, uh, you know, talk about as, as thinking it's more of a national or state level uh, matter versus international crime, but how these movement has created and bring uh, on the, uh, in the international uh, awareness or knowledge that this is international crime uh, against uh, women, girl, and all these issues, gender-based violence. So, uh, Sophie, when we talk about uh, gender-based violence, war, conflict, we are keep hearing still in present time after we, we know this is now has been identified in United Nations organization as well. This is um, international crime. But we keep, we are keep hearing this such crime and this heinous crime are keep taking place when we identify maybe conflict and war zones. Uh, what do you think? Is it is it something is still uh, people have, or maybe this is something that uh, during the war or conflict they take as a strategy or tool to uh, put uh, other country or other their purpose to get solved? Or what what you understand? Maybe you can share something you have worked in that. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a very, very good question. Um, we, well, we need uh, laws like international criminal law to establish uh, war crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide. Um, but that doesn't mean that in, in, in the war itself, uh, when, when it, the battle is, is so high uh, and, and stakes are so high, um, they're, you're really in the, in the midst of war, people just go and they will commit crimes uh, no matter what. So uh, the international criminal law won't have uh, a preventative uh, function there. Um, it, it's more like uh, in a, a post 
conflict society. Mm -hmm. You need all the, the, the structures in, in the countries. There, there's no functioning police system. There's no functioning judicial system. So everything, the entire country is war torn. So you need uh, structures um, like international uh, tribunals or courts to help these people uh, achieve justice and uh, not just from the west but you need a hybrid court with locals uh, uh, and, and all their expertise uh, so it, yes that's very very uh, essential very important but it will unfortunately it's inherent to humanity to commit crimes in uh, in wars uh, whether that is gender-based or um, or not uh, just mere killings um, will, will happen and won't stop uh, as soon as you criminalize that. Mm -hmm. um, but you can focus on, of course, other preventative tools is also uh, about uh, education awareness raising. If you make sure that um, the, 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 the conflicts, the, the emotions that are already there before the start of an actual conflict, if you make sure that you listen to all the groups um, if you uh, make sure that all the, 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 the rights of minorities are being embedded in their constitution and are <laughs> being guaranteed also mm -hmm. in practical terms, then you are uh, working on prevention. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas criminal law is more uh, afterward. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah I think that, that way you should hear that we can't, uh, we can't escape these uh, kind of things, but we can work on more preventive mechanism. Uh, do you find as a preventive mechanism, many countries are now developing uh, moreover women in combat and it can be one of very strong approach or very strong, uh, you know, as a, as a tool or as a mechanism to counter these kind of, uh, especially uh, gender-based uh, crime in war or in conflict we can mitigate or we can maybe control? That's a very, very good question. I think that would be a, a wonderful preventative tool because uh, you will have more uh, more variety in, in your group um, because we do still have the, these stories of not only um, underground groups uh, raping and uh, killing, but even uh, UN peacekeepers, for example, who should be there to really keep the peace. But then there's also some peacekeepers who commit uh, gender-based violence uh, themselves. And that also took a lot of lobbying and women's rights organization to get that out in the public. But if you have more uh, women uh, in the armed forces there too, trained, um, and if you train the men as well, uh, of, okay, you're going into combat, you're going to face these horrible circumstances. What can you do um, if you yourself uh, suffer from extreme uh, emotions, anger, PTSD, depression, uh, because of course these people are, are human and they will be influenced uh, by what they see as well. And if you're able to to channel that in more healthier ways, mm -hmm. you will prevent these these crazy outcries. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And uh, when we are talking all about leadership, women, gender, uh, based on your work for uh, all women background, all level of uh, women, those are listening and watching us as our audience and listeners. What kind of one tool you would like to give them that they should have? Uh, when they would like to talk about leadership, women, what what it should be? Yeah, that's a very, very good and important question, especially for the audience, because we've tackled so many very uh, broad and very big issues that people uh, might get the feeling, oh, help, I don't know where to start. What What is it that I can do? Uh, well, individuals, I always advise them, be sure that um, uh, in, 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 when it comes to leadership, what are the core values that you embrace? They're always personal. So uh, there, there are so many values. What is it exactly that you um, uh, embrace and how will that guide you? That will make you stronger as a person and also to stand up for other people, uh, to, to speak up um, and to really 
dare to lead. So people often don't know where to start, but it just really start with yourself. Who am I and what do I really stand for? And if you know that, then you can help other people and, and really uh, stand up for other people. So reflect and stand up for other people and just dare to take the lead. Wonderful, wonderful. So stand up and reflect and dare to take the lead, right? Is it correct? Uh, Sophie, and when we are talking all about how you see uh, yourself as uh, your leadership style. Uh, for me personally? Yeah, yeah. as, as, as <laughs> yeah, you do the yeah. work for women. So how you define your leadership style? Yeah, of course, uh, that's personal for everybody. For me, um, I'm, I'm really uh, just like the, the heroines of the book and, and the women that I uh, look at. And that's why I uh, admire them so much. I have an extremely strong moral compass. So that's also the lawyer in me that's really uh, peace, justice, and equal treatment. So I cannot mm -hmm. stand it when other people are uh, treated differently. Um, and I hope that by my work, by my books, by my talks, I will inspire other people uh, to reflect and to think, okay, what is it that I stand for? Uh, what are my own core values? And, and hopefully that will be a catalyst for change uh, in the world. And if you can only reach one person, it's already worth it. Wonderful. And when we talk about leadership, when we talk about women, how you find, last but not least, how you find a global talk show or a platform like Women Dialogue is so important or needed? It's extremely important uh, because it, uh, it is all about awareness raising, about um, education, but also bringing together different voices. Um, like you said, you, you interview so many people from all over the world with so many different uh, backgrounds. Uh, I always find it very inspirational to, to also listen to, to other voices, especially from people uh, with completely different backgrounds, also uh, academically or, or work-wise, if they're not academics, uh, cultural backgrounds, because you can learn so much from each other's stories, and that way you will be able to come up with more innovative uh, solutions and go hand in hand and fight for equality. So I think you're doing an excellent job. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Sophie. Yes, we have uh, till till today we have bought more than sixty four countries women uh, out oh, wow. of our all recorded shows, and we are looking forward to develop more and more this global women voice through our women dialogues, and we wish all the very best to you for your present and future work, and uh, we want that you should achieve all your success, health, and prosperity. And thank you for being with us today, for sharing your work, sharing your wisdom, and sharing how these uh, issues, the work you are doing is important to create awareness, to talk about. So thank you, Sophie. Well, thank you so much and keep up the great work. And thanks to all our audience who are listening and watching us. As you hear from Sophie, about her work, about her expertise, why such works are important and how you can develop your women leadership or other way, other leadership qualities in your work, in your, uh, in your individual, your life. You can connect with Sophie. Along with that, you can hear this episode. If you feel still you need more support, we are going to put the details in the description about Sophie. So get connect with her. Don't miss this opportunity. And we are here, as again, always I'm saying, we are here to grow together, develop together, and to inspire and motivate all each other. And with this note, I will come with one more new speaker as bringing more knowledge, no more wisdom to inspire you. Till then, take care. Bye-bye.